Well then, Craig, would you be in the mood for telling us whether you would love <laughs> I'm in the mood for something, Drew. <laughs> I'm in the mood yeah. for love. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> um, okay. Hong Kong, 1962. Mrs. Chan, Maggie Chung, a secretary, and Mr. Chow, Tony Leung, a journalist, are two people who, along with their respective spouses, both begin to rent adjoining apartments on the same day. To the casual observer, both appear to be happily married. However, as viewers, we soon become aware that something is off. Mrs. Chan's husband seemingly spends most of his time away on business trips, while the equally nebulous Mrs. Chow is frequently likewise away with work or tending to distant ill relatives. Soon it begins to dawn on our two leads that their spouses are having an affair. But in the aftermath of this revelation, the pair choose to keep their knowledge on the lowdown and form a bond of friendship that becomes increasingly romantic throughout the course of the movie. Vowing never to be like their partners, the pair agree that they must remain faithful in order to uphold both the outward appearance of their respective relationships, but also their own dignity. Eventually, Chow confesses to Chan that his feelings for her have gone way beyond those the pair promised he would allow, and to spare them any further torment, he moves to Shanghai in pursuit of a job opportunity. Now, as far as plot is concerned, what with this being a Wong Kar Wai joint, that's almost your lot. Mm. Not quite, but almost. If you listened to our last podcast on the topic, you remember we had variable results, um, and in particular I felt let down by the reputation of Days of Being Wild. In the Mood for Love shares a great deal with that movie, indeed the pair are part of an unofficial trilogy of sorts along with 2046, but whereas that movie felt about as flyaway as it gets, here, at arguably the apex of his career, Wong manages a wonderful feat in marrying that subtlety of unobtrusive plot with depth of character, genuine emotional resonance, and an atmosphere bordering on the tangible. Much of the movie's success is due to Chung and Leung as a nascent couple, their subtle chemistry occasionally simmering as they orbit each other in a way that's both believable and satisfying. It would have been easy to play this one for over-the-top melodrama, but it is at all times reserved and all the more heartbreaking for it. Both Chow and Chan are likeable, empathetic characters in a way that is thrown into stark relief by both the behaviour of their spouses, almost entirely absent from screen, only occasionally glimpsed from behind or heard from across a hallway, and also their dignity, of which Wong affords them plenty. Speaking of dignity, I think it's interesting to observe how much of it Wong affords the female leads of his movies, in stark contrast to much of Western cinema's output for the same period. Maggie Chung could easily have phoned in this performance on looks alone had she so desired, because believe me when I say, she is an absolute vision in every frame of this movie, but her calm resolve as Mrs Chan is at least equally as beautiful to behold, and we are in no doubt that she is fully in charge of her own destiny throughout. Likewise, this might be my favourite performance from Tony Leung, whose similar resolve and eventual epiphany that he no longer holds the affair against his wife, as he understands how easy it is to fall in love, is just as quietly heartbreaking. Those two central performances ought really to be enough, but in this instance, miraculously, we are spoiled by frankly world-class cinematography led by frequent collaborator Christopher Doyle, beautiful costume designed by William Chang, and totally on-point art direction courtesy of Lim Chung Man. And anyone who's listened to our podcast for any length of time know that I never call out those departments by name. Um, I don't know if I've settled on how to articulate my thoughts about the cinematography in particular, but if Chris Doyle had laid the camera down at the end of shooting and announced his destiny in this life had been fulfilled and then disappeared in a puff of smoke, I doubt anyone could have acted surprised. <laughs> that all of this comes together in a single package is frankly remarkable, enough so that I might now be forced to go back and rewatch Days of Being Wild to ensure I haven't made a terrible mistake. I don't think I did, but that's okay. Only having In the Mood for Love is enough for me. It actually made me reassess my feelings towards 2046, but we'll talk about that in a bit. Suffice to say, outside of that movie, this is the first time I feel Wong's reputation has been fully realised for me, and it's really great stuff. Yeah, you said at the end there, Craig, almost exactly what I was going to make my first point to say is that uh, this, as we mentioned in our last podcast, was the film that was the reason why we did this episode at all. Mm -hmm. It's 20 years now since it premiered at Cannes. Mm -hmm. And and we were supposed to have a 4K remaster on tour as we speak, Drew. Yeah, and watching this and like, ah, right, now I get it. Mm -hmm. I properly get it. Um, because it's weird. I'm, I was absolutely convinced that I'd seen several Wong Kar Wai films 
up till we're doing this podcast you know, mm. somehow managed to see one and knew enough about a few others that seemed to have like decided I'd seen them you and me you and me both and I was adamant I had seen this movie yeah. and now I'm wondering what the movie was that I had actually seen yeah. <laughs> um, I know at one point when we were putting this list together I kept on sticking Lost Caution because I was convinced Lost Caution was a the Wong Kar Wai film no, but it's not it's Ang Lee um, uh, that so might make sense you know I've maybe done something like that um, that's also Tony Leung I think I remember so well since I've seen it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was already back on board with Happy Together. I thoroughly enjoyed that. But I got, then I watched all these in release order. And I got to In the Mood for Love, realized, oh, I haven't seen this then. Uh, I don't know what I was thinking, but also, right, yes, get this now. This is uh-huh. excellent. Uh-huh. I really, really like this. I see why people were talking about this film a lot of 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it's just beautiful and heartbreaking. And actually, that's, again, I mentioned it a few moments before in the last film but the heartbreaking thing is kind of getting to me because like mm. just once well, there, there was one happy ending as I said but you know they, they don't want to cheat on their spouses because like they say um, that'll make them uh, us just as bad as them it's okay but you get to the point where you clearly love each other is the moral high ground really worth your misery mm. <laughs> at that point um, after the cheating's already been done by the other half of your um, partnership so I don't know it's just, I don't know, kind of frustrating in the end because it's perhaps stronger in narrative than almost anything else he's done. Mm-hmm. And it's at that point, because it's, you just like, well, just, just, I want a slightly more satisfying ending because you've done misery already. <laughs> I know. And it's the point at which she goes, she goes to Shanghai and she phones him at his work from his hotel room. <laughs> <laughs> and then when he gets back, she's gone. I just wanted to bury my head in a pillow and cry for him. I just, oh, my days. And then after that, obviously, there is a scene that suggests that something actually might have happened ultimately between the two of them, subtly. But I understand that that is the accepted version of events, uh, if you read between the lines. And it's like, all oh, right, okay, so... Yeah, they did consummate things eventually, but it's that uh, it, finishing on that lingering note of what might have been is just like, oh, it's, <laughs> it's satisfying in a way because I don't. We always talk about how we don't we don't like things to be necessarily tied up neatly and leaving things open ended, or all things not being resolved. But in this occasion, I just wanted the two of them to be happy together. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, because it wasn't like it was a toxic relationship. Um, it wasn't like they were going to make each other miserable or anything they yeah. had behaved um, honourably to themselves and their spouses they had been decent people you know they just and they were actually they were both suffering the same hurt mm-hmm. it's like and they should have ended up together and didn't and it's like ah mm-hmm. <laughs> this one time why are you so miserable one car why why <laughs> it's kind of the way it, I accept it's the way it has to be and I think that resolution will keep me coming back to this movie because I, I think that honestly, if it had all been resolved in a nice happy ending, I don't know that I would necessarily feel the need back, uh, feel the need to come back and revisit it. But I am certainly going to do that now because this film has immediately gone in like way up my list of movies in general, and I just I'm desperate to I'm desperate for a chance to rewatch this, uh, especially. <laughs> <laughs> Especially because my TV didn't want to uh, play back subtitles for some reason, and I ended up sitting watching this in my Mac, and it's and and it's a nice iMac. It's got a really nice screen, but it's still only like a twenty one and a half inch screen or something, and it, it still wasn't doing the cinematography justice. And I'm sorry, but the cinematography in this film. I got to the end of this film and I thought to myself, oh, is that it? Not because I was disappointed in anything, but because I can't remember the last time I came across a film where where I reached the end and I could honestly say there's not a single wasted shot in that film because literally there's not a shot in this film that isn't either... Uh, you know, plot related, driving things forward, or at least just if it's there just for the sake of being there, aesthetically stunning. Yeah. <laughs> so I just got, yeah, I mean, I, my mind was blown just by the cinematography. I just, I have no idea. I don't even think this, I don't think they didn't win, they might have won at cinematography. I think they won, I think Christopher Doyle won technical prize at Cannes for the cinematography. He and his sort of co cinematographer on this. Um, yeah, they won the technical grand prize at Cannes for this. Yeah, the fact that I don't think they won any cinematography prizes necessarily or like major ones outside of that is just, I need to go back and watch every movie that was nominated in 2000 now because 
I want to know what film looked better than this. I know. He won uh, the National Society of Film Critics in the US, the New York Film Critics Circle, Asia Pacific Film Festival. It didn't even it didn't even win at the Hong Kong Film Festival though. That's yeah. nuts. I think the I think uh, both the leads won best uh, actor, and he may uh, Wong Kar Wai may have won best director something, but they, I don't think they won for cinematography. That is nuts. Nominated. Yeah, that is nuts. Absolute nuts. I want a word with whoever made that decision. <laughs> no, can we just not because I think we established a long time ago all award shows are meaningless because oh. they're always wrong, especially in retrospect. Yes. Um, but that's what I. So whereas. Dances with wolves. <laughs> Shush. <laughs> Tatonka. Shush. Yeah, so whereas I think aesthetically uh, I was drawn into... Uh, I, well, I don't want to talk about 2046 yet because you're going to talk about that at length, Drew. But I, I was immediately aesthetically drawn into that film and that's where my uh, love of that film grew from initially. Whereas this time round, and especially off the back of my disappointment with uh, Days of Being Wild, the first thing... well. Technically, first thing that drew me in was was this film visually because I think even the second shot of this film, which is uh, Maggie Chung looking out of a window, I was just like, oh my God. I was immediately drawn in by the characterization in this film that I was not in a in uh, Days of Being Wild. And it really caught me off guard because I went into this set of films expecting to be just as disappointed. Um, this film had characterization, Craig, which was the oh. big difference. <laughs> well, it's not that Days of Being Wild lacked characterization. It's just that I think Leslie Chung's character in that film wasn't necessarily all that empathetic. Um, and I think it was a oh, pretty, really pretty steep character. buy-in. He had a couple of character traits. He didn't have a character. Yeah. And none of those traits was... Um, appealing at all yeah to get. and it's not that that's you know it's not that that's something you can't have in a movie but just when I look at the praise heaped on that film I found it I felt really disconnected from that mm-hmm. and so I was expecting to be just as disconnected from the uh, you know the various assessments of this but right from the off I was that was me I was in and yeah I'm absolutely heartbroken to think that we're supposed to be sitting looking at a 4k restoration of this right now but I you know we'll, we'll get there eventually and there's there's a reason why we can't but yeah, that's that's really something to look forward to, man. <laughs> if Fact and Liverpool are going to show that, then the same way that they did, because I believe it was, I believe it's been supervised by Wong Kar Wai and Criterion, the same way that the Barry Lyndon uh, restoration was. <laughs> uh, so if Fact and Liverpool are, are showing this, I'll be I'll be buying three tickets so I can have a spare seat either side. Thank you very much. <laughs> you know, one full of sweets and the other with just a stack of pillows to cry into or something. <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I've not been saying much because I've just been not long, a long in agreement. Uh, yeah, it's really, really, really good. Um, if Happy Together can have solved the character part of the, the why uh, Wong's character conundrum, then this sort of ties it all back in with that glorious period detail and the mm. just beautiful cinematography and all that, and it just looks absolutely fantastic. It really ties the film together. So, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. wonderful, wonderful yeah. stuff. Yeah. It's one of those... It's a I'm not going to say overused um, just because it's very often actually an appropriate word. It doesn't. It's not a word like crisis, which has lost its meaning by overuse. But it's one of those words where you just look at it and the word sumptuous mm-hmm. doesn't bubble into the top of your mind. Yeah. yeah, even in a sort of relatively dilapidated apartment, like when when they're in the kitchen and stuff. You know, the units are all falling apart and everything. But there's you know there's there's Maggie Chung looking absolutely immaculate I don't oh my days I could just spend the whole film honestly I could spend the whole film just looking at Maggie Chung she looks amazing she looks amazing the costume design her outfits are all identical um, but they differ in pattern and colour and uh I just think she, she just every frame she's in, she just moves through like some ethereal <laughs> goddess. It's a, it's amazing. And then you get to like the set design and stuff, and the the set dressing and the decoration and the lighting and sort of like the period, even you know the 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 diner that they meet in to have dinner dates and stuff. Even like the the choice of crockery there, the the cups and the plates and stuff. I'm fascinated by. <laughs> They've all got this luminous quality about them. It's just amazing. I've never wanted, I've never felt, or at least it's been a long time since I felt so immediately at home in the environment that a movie presents. And I don't remember the last time that something so essentially sort of run down and drab looked so appealing, if that makes sense. You know, because they're not living a high life. They're not living in a multi-million dollar apartment. They're they're living in like really cheap rented accommodation, but somehow it still feels really appealing. And it's not just the dressing, it's also like the characters as well. I'm like, yeah, I would like to spend time with these people. <laughs> so For balance, my only knock on the film is, you know, the very end when mm-hmm. uh, Tony Lynn goes to Anchor Watt mm-hmm. 
do you think that's just because they wanted to go to Anchor Watt? Because it doesn't seem to have any particular relevance to Anchor Watt in particular. Uh, no. See, there's... I actually meant to go... I was thinking Anchor Watt and Tom was like, everything just looked beautiful, even if it didn't actually yeah. serve the story, and it did like that. It looked striking. I was wondering that why Anchor... Because it, it didn't come up in the rest of the film. Um, yeah. So why that, I don't know. But what I did mean to go back was, was to check... Because 2046 begins with something that is mentioned in in The Mood for Love, which oh, I think it's in The Mood for Love. It's maybe actually one of the other films now I think about it. But one of the characters tells another character about the story of um, how do you keep a secret. I think it's in The Mood for Love. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And you speak oh, yeah. into a tree. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's like, this. Yeah. Yeah. And because 2046 begins with that, again, mm-hmm. I was actually wondering, did he... Because you sort of see him leaning against a wall then, or what? But I wasn't paying sufficient of attention. To, like, actually, it's, it's like a hole in that wall where it's a, a secret. That's, that's it's a, what he's doing. It's but a bullet hole. Yeah. not a tree. Yes, I know. Yeah. I know it's a bullet. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a bullet hole, isn't it? I think from uh, yeah or something like that. Yeah. Yes, I don't know why Angkor because Singapore is the other place that they go, and Days of Being Wild had some Filipino characters or Chinese Filipinos. But there's not really anything to do with Cambodia in, in the Midful Love, so why they went to Angkor Wat? Yeah, it's, it's a bit odd. Yeah, I don't know if this is as like some kind of deeper symbolic meaning, or if it means that part of the production cost was paid for by the Cambodian tourist board. I don't know, one of the two. <laughs> That's also possible. It's, it's quite possible. It's thanking all of the people at Angkor Wat, but yeah. you would do that anyway if you'd yeah. gone. But uh, Listen, for the hour and 35 that precedes it, I'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So will we move on then? Yeah, regretfully, I think we should. I'd quite happily stay in this moment forever, Drew, but never mind. <laughs> uh.